Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's session uh, honoring Black History Month. We have a really honored speaker today, someone I consider a longtime friend, someone I hold in very high regard. And um, we got to do a little warm up session before we began at 10 o'clock today. And we just, there was just so much energy vibrating between uh, Morgantown and Charleston that I, I can't wait to hear from our speaker. And I'm going to give her um, um, the introduction that she deserves because I think everyone who is participating and uh, watching this event will want to know um, a little bit about Misha's background. So let me begin. We have today speaking Misha L. Poor Esquire. She is the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, at West Virginia University. But let me, let me give you a little more than that. Misha is a longtime champion of underrepresented people. And in her role at West Virginia University, she carries the title of Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer for the West Virginia University Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. In that role, she motivates the entire Mountaineer family to recognize the value in diversity and challenges all who interact with her to create transformational change. Misha, I'm waiting to be challenged today, so, so we'll get to that. But let's talk a little more about her background. Misha has been helping light the way toward equity throughout her career. She is an attorney who served in the West Virginia House of Delegates from 2009 to 2014. She is also an accomplished and sought after motivational speaker. And she provides public and political uh, leadership in a consulting and strategy role. The Women's Campaign Fund named her a game changer during her campaign for the U.S. House of Representatives for West Virginia's previous second congressional district. She has mentored and consulted with hundreds of elected officials throughout the nation as they seek higher office. She's an experienced educator who served as an adjunct professor at West Virginia State University um, and as a faculty member in residence at the Center for American Women in Politics at Rutgers University. And she has teaching privileges at the West Virginia University College of Law. In 2017, Misha Poor became the first African-American woman named president of the West Virginia State Bar since its 1947 founding. Prior to operating her own practice, she was an attorney in the office of the Kanawha County Public Defender in Charleston, West Virginia. She's an alumna of the prestigious German Marshall Memorial Fellowship, a member of the executive committee for the Council on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities, and is president of the Big 12 Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education. She earned her bachelor's degree from Howard University in Washington, D.C., and her law degree from Southern University Law Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She also graduated from the Women's Campaign School at Yale University. Poor has recently facilitated insightful conversations with leading voices in social justice work, including Ibrahim X. Kendi, National Book Award winner and author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, Nicole Hannah-Jones, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and creator of the Landmark 1619 Project, and W. Kamu Bell, socio-political comedian and host of the Emmy Award winning CNN docuseries, United Shades of America. With that introduction, I'd like to just take the privilege of saying, Misha, please introduce yourself for our audience. Share what first comes to mind as Black History Month winds up today. That's probably two questions in one. So you take it and go. I can't wait. 
<laughs> well, first of all, thank you to each of you all for the invitation. To everyone that's participating live and those that will be watching the recording, I want to thank you for taking time to even be here today. I know you have a lot of things you could be doing, but you've taken a, an intentional effort to grow your knowledge base and to grow yourself. Um, I thank you for that amazing introduction. Thank you so much, Steve. What I will say to you is, you know, um, the different months that we celebrate, like Black History Month, are awareness months. And so Black history is American history. The reality is it doesn't end today. It lasts 365 days out of the year. The reason for Awareness Month is just, like I said before, we're so busy and inundated with our lives that sometimes we don't pay attention to what other things are happening in spaces. So these Awareness Months are created to make us pause. Interestingly, it gives you about, we'll say 28 days, we'll use February, it gives you 28 days to find time and space to figure out how you can learn more and add to your Rolodex of historical moments for America. And so what I always like to say, and sometimes we forget, and I have to remind myself that I too am Black history, um, to be able to be the first African American to ever represent the 37th district, now firm, formerly known as the 31st district, to be the first African American woman to represent as president for the West Virginia State Bar, and to have the blessed life that I've been given um, when I did not first generation college student. Uh, my mom eventually went back to school and got her master's degree in her 60s, so I'm very proud of her. Um, my dad was a Vietnam veteran um, and, uh, and, and worked for a KRT, actually, there in Kanawha County. And so the reality is that the things in which we accomplish, we stand on the shoulders of the people that come before us. And, and those things are, are very important to me. My roots here in West Virginia, I, too, am Appalachia. I think oftentimes we we talk about black history, but we don't also always tie in how black history is also a part of Appalachia. When you look at the documentaries that you see, you don't always see me um, or other individuals that have contributed. But since we're here in Black History Month, I'm gonna hone in on the black community and the things in which we've done for Appalachia. And so that's what I, I would say is that how as West Virginians can we begin to celebrate the history that lies within these hills? We often go outside of it, but what do we have to give for each other? How can we learn from each other? So I hope that answered your question. I love the answer, and um, maybe today is not the day for it, but uh, or maybe it is, but I'd love to open the door sometime to a discussion about West Virginia's role in the early days of statehood and, and the, how we were a little bit different from some other places. We were different in that we were open to education for black students. We, I think that's why we have such history with uh, Carter Woodson and Clinton Barnett and other uh, early uh, black educators. And um, I'm not, I don't want to put you on the spot and say, gee, let's have a history lesson right no. now. I mean, I think that you're absolutely right. Um, Booker T. Washington, out of Alden, West Virginia, uh, and the work that he did there. Um, Niagara Falls, that, that was here in, you know, in West Virginia. I do think it's important when we think about the movement of diversity. We talk about diversity, equity, inclusion. What role did West Virginia play in the creation of America? Um, and how we looked at our history and how we stood up to say what we would stand for. Oftentimes, I would say to you, we allow individuals to place on them what they think West Virginia you should be versus us really digging into the roots, the foundation and the history of what we have always been and pull out who we actually are. I think that's crucially important when you think about history and we begin to see, you know, we're, we'll eventually, I know what you all do so well, um, making sure that West Virginia has a future, economically sound, that our children have a place and a space, as we would say. Uh, when we're talking about those things, it's crucially important that we never forget where we've come from. And sometimes that's rediscovering the, the advancement and the progression that we actually have had as it relates to embracing different communities, how we have actually seen each other for who we are and the value of who we are. When we think about the coal mining industry, and we talk about that often, we have a lot of pride in that of how it has grown some of our communities and how we're growing uh, in, in other ways in the state. But the reality is the coal mining industry brought in a lot of different communities. And those things and those individuals and things in which they contribute to this state are to our history. And so when we're talking about Black history and we're talking about Indigenous communities, when we're talking about our, 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 our AAPI communities, when we're talking about just go through a list of communities that have contributed 
Italian, our Italian communities, what have they done for the state of West Virginia? How can we pull out those great roots and begin to really build on who we really are versus what people tell us we are? Um, and so when we talk about Black History Month, it is West Virginian history as it is American history. And the only reason why we have to talk about Awareness Month is because we forget that. We forget that that too is our history. Well, thank you. I'm so pleased that you uh, that you were wanted to talk about that a little bit. You know, um, one of the things that we think about uh, within our for our members and among other associations is how can we be part of helping make West Virginia a more diverse state, and how can we be part of making our own associations and workplaces more open and more diverse. I am sure that we overlook things. I, I am sure that we are blind to things that, that someone else's eyes, someone who might be coming from a different place or a different point of view would see. We, can, can we talk about that for a few minutes? Absolutely. I mean, I think different perspectives and experiences as to the real quilt of who we are. And the reality is when you're looking around the table and everybody looks like you, have the same age as you, come from the same neighborhood as you, you've been longtime friends for 30 years, you might have the same story and perspective. And as we know, it is bringing in fresh ideas and, and new perspectives that allows us to really grow who we are as industry, that allows us to grow who we are as a state, that welcomes new ideas and, and um, you know, it, it allows us to see our gaps. I think that's crucially important. It's almost like I'll go, you know, I'll go to what I know as far as being a lawyer. You know, I can sit here and do an opening a state, uh, you know, when I'm doing my case, I can do a voir dire, I could go and do an opening statement. And if I read it just to myself and never bounce it off of someone else and say, do you think that makes sense? Have I proved a point? Have I, have I presented my case? If I only talk to me, then I only am impressing me. But if I allow other people to listen to what the argument is, the, 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 the case study, if you might, to say, hey, what does this look like to you? Then you start getting perspectives that tells you, you know, it sounds good, but there's a gap there that I think we could feel better if you would might add this or beginning just to be asked questions. I would say to you, opening your mind to different thought processes. It's not always about someone trying to give you information. More so is that, can I be open-minded and just allowing conversation? Can I, can I be vulnerable enough? Oftentimes when we are leaders of organizations and, and companies, we have either either earned to build them up from the bottom to the top of where they are now. We don't want anyone to really come in and show us a shortcoming. That sometimes can feel weak to be vulnerable around a team of something you don't know, because you're supposed to know everything. But a true leader, a true leader allows people to show them where there may be a gap and how they can feel in. And exactly when you talk about a true leader, a true leader knows how to delegate. You hire people to make you the leader in the sense of that they add to the value of who you are. You don't have to know how to do everything. You have to trust your team to be able to say, you know, Vice President Poor, I think that we might be needing to lean here. Or, you know, Vice President Poor, I like that idea, but to be able to listen to people who have different perspective and ideas allows you to grow as an individual, allows your company opportunity to address more and have an outreach that you might not originally thought you would have when you first came up with the idea. I have to say, I bet no student has ever gone to sleep in your class. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I don't know if I can say that though. <laughs> I, I, I love your, uh, I, I love the fact that you opened the door and are talking about leadership and, and what leadership really looks like and, and acts like. Tell us a little, uh, West Virginia University is one of our state's uh, shining uh, lights. Uh, you from West Virginia University provide leadership to our state in many ways. Tell us a little bit about what is happening at West Virginia University in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. What, what are you proud of and, and what can the rest of us learn from what you've been doing? 
Sure. So, I mean, Western Union University is a land grant institution. And so our commitment goes beyond Morgantown. It goes beyond the surrounding area. It is to touch the state, but truthfully, it is to touch the globe. We are creating global ambassadors here. So when we educate people, we tell people often that when you come here, you're getting access to people who speak 150 uh, languages. You're getting someone from 55 different counties in the state of West Virginia. And so you really do have an opportunity to kind of do a tour of the world by just being here on campus. If you take that opportunity, you know, if you just want to sit in your classroom, if you just want to sit in your office, you never want to expose yourself to anything new, then you're going to get what you always got, the same story and maybe the same, the same memories. But what we want people to do is grow. And so we try to allow them to have that opportunity. And those things are like diversity week. Diversity week is a week that we do every year. Um, we are now expanding it across our university system. So that's our Potomac campus, as well as our uh, Potomac State, as well as West Virginia Tech. Um, and what we do is we, ha we have conversations like speaker series. We do International Street Festival. We get to talk about different foods and cultures and ideas. Um, we allow people, we have something called Purpose Institute that is also happening here on campus. And what that does is allow people to, to uh, we talk about leadership. And when we talk about diversity, I have to say, I can't separate the two. To be a diverse, uh, to be a leader means that you understand the concept of diversity. That you understand that you have, you know, that there's some things you might need to grow in, but there's some things you can initiate as a leader that people listen to you for a reason and you use that authority and that voice to do so. We have first generation college students here. So we have a program that really embraces first generations to make sure that they're successful and pushes them uh, to the to matriculating out of the institution and hopefully going into uh, another degree. Um, we do trainings, of course. We do conversations and deep discussions about this. We have something called cultural autobiography that comes out of our office. All of us have a culture. All of us have something that makes up who we are. Often when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, we have a way of thinking it's other. We provide difference. We, we, we see it as it's not us. And so the reality is when you're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and we talk about cultural autobiography, we're asking people to find their self in this work because we're easy to push it off as someone else that should be doing it. And the reality is that each of us have a responsibility or should see ourselves as having a responsibility and accountability of diving deeper into how we can diversify whatever piece of the world we own. And that might be if that's your home, that you're, you're a stay-at-home mom, if you are a stay-at-home dad, if you are someone who's a community member and you go to your church, if you are someone is at the legislature, if you're someone that owns a, a corporation and an industry, finding yourself in this work of diversity, equity, and inclusion is what we start with here, but we push out throughout the university and throughout the, throughout the state to say, hey, look, we all have a role to play here. We all wanna make this state great. And so how to do that? We need to be inclusive. Wow, thank you so much. Well, how can students, parents, and attendees learn more about the diversity uh, recruitment initiatives uh, and programs that are being offered currently? So I will tell you our Instagram is pretty hot. Um, if you wanted to look at our Instagram, we have something called Yappy Hour. I do want to talk about Yappy Hour. Yappy Hour actually came in the midst of COVID. So during the pandemic, our graduate assistants kept seeing, and you all might have experienced this too, puppies, tails going across the screen, or maybe a cat tail that went across the screen during the middle of a meeting. And we realized that people began to smile more when those incidents happened. So people might apologize. I'm so sorry for my cat, Tom. I'm so sorry for my puppy, Jim. But the reality was there was joy brought into the space. So we have worked with Hearts of Gold, which is one of our, our service uh, uh, programs that, uh, that trains dogs to go in and do just that care for people give them joy provide space into their into the place so when we talk about diversity it's not always have to be a heavy discussion that's mental health that's ability to be able to walk into your classroom and be whole for a moment because some people are dealing with things we can't always see and so when we're talking about families and students and things like that finding themselves in some of these activities like a yappy hour which we do throughout the whole entire year that list is up they can just go pet a puppy for an hour 
We also give out succulents, which we call, you know, we, you know, we tell them, you know, thank you for helping me grow. And we put a little stick in there and have them pay attention to something other than maybe just they're, they're taking their midterms. So what I would say to parents, we have a parents uh, uh, group and there's a magazine and a newsletter that goes out. Pay attention to those activities and let your student know that that's happening. Unfortunately, our students don't always read their emails. They don't always look at, at, at the, the notifications. So maybe you as a parent can get that information to them. We have websites that are always listing activities and events. Um, and we push out as much publication as we can um, uh, to, to ensure that people are seeing uh, the work that we're doing. And I want to backtrack to the question that you asked me earlier about organizations and what they can do. And I talked a little bit about finding themselves an individual as a leader, how they can do it, but also what's your messaging and how are you marketing your intent? I want to make sure that we talk about that because you really do send a message. We know this. When you do publications, when you do your ads, you spend a whole lot of time on websites. You do a whole lot of time on logos and the imagery, the polo shirts you wear out to the golfing activity. When you have a, a, a function or a reception, the lay of how you do things. Well, what's your message? to your constituency, your community, as to where you stand with diversity, equity, inclusion work? What's your outreach in communities? Are you there only during Black History Month? Are you there throughout the whole entire year? Because I guarantee you, the communities need you throughout the whole entire year. Um, are you are you there as a sponsor for one event? Are you there as an actual networking tool, a mentor, or someone that's willing to work with organizations that are programming that really can get into the hearts and minds of individuals in the community? So what are the things that you're doing for messaging, marketing, and community engagement? Crucially important as it relates to diversity, equity, inclusion, but most importantly, what are you individually taking yourself and owning some responsibility of how you want to grow yourself, not just in the month of February, but throughout the whole entire year? So many good ideas already. Do you have, are there any organizations that you particularly want to highlight or would like us to pay attention to that we haven't discussed yet? So I'm going to say something that's going to seem extremely weird. But when I was growing up in Charleston, one of my favorite places to go, which has been newly renovated, that I actually have not had a chance to visit yet, is the Kanawha County Public Library. Okay. And I know that we have Google. And I know that there's a lot of access and I know they have an online uh, a database that you can actually pull from. I'm, I, I know I can talk about a lot of different groups right now, but what I want people to really be responsible for is their individual growth. Because if I can't help people find empathy in other communities or for other individuals, then the, 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 then the business study, I can give you the business model all day. But if I cannot talk to you as a person, meeting you where you are, allowing you to say, hey, in your time, in your comfort, find something that interests you. Diversity is very fluid. Oftentimes, because we live in this state, in West Virginia, we make it about black and white. But it is so much more than just black and white. It is those things as well. But it is. Our, our ability, whether you have a disability, whether it be this physical or invisible, whether it be your gender, your intersectionality of the identities in which you hold, whether it be that you 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 op, you 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 represent another community, the reality is you need to be able to show up as yourself, and and individuals who are leaders have to create environments that allows that and welcomes that, um, and and if you can't, you need to do some deep diving as to why that is. You know, we talk about perspective. Nothing that I've said is telling you that you need to change your perspective. I hope that you would if it's something that's stopping us from growing as a state. But it is saying you cannot see your perspective if you don't take time to question it, if you don't take time to do some self-reflection. And so when I talk about organizations, you can certainly come to some of the programming events that we have. We have a lot of groups here that you can engage in. Your students have a lot of student organizations. We have over 400 organizational groups that people can engage in from Star Wars all the way down to our Muslim Association. It, it, and, I, and I don't take any of that lightly because all of it matters to those people that it needs to matter for. And so how do you find yourself in the place that you get you're in and how do you make space if those spaces are not available to people It's crucially, crucially important. And so I would say the Canal County Library, your local library, your university libraries have access and information that allows you to dive deeper into information that I cannot do in a short frame of time that we have here. And you really cannot get in a lot of webinars. You're going to get a touch of it. 
but you're going to have to do some homework. And I often say that this requires some heart work, which means you have to go to your heart and really do some reflection. I talk about the Harvard implicit bias study often because that's something that most people know and is for free. You go in and you do your own evaluation. You find the areas that you feel you might need to grow and you challenge yourself. No one knows the outcome but you. You challenge. That's a good way to start. But that's hard work to really see yourself and maybe see where you think you might have grown and you really need some more work. Then I say you need to do some homework. That homework is what I've told you. Finding these organizations, finding books that might be helpful for people's growth or, you know, book clubs are always still in. Like, I don't know, but hey, maybe you just ask your wife, your husband, your best friend, your daughter, your son, hey, can we read this book together and let's talk about it as a family? That's that homework because sometimes taking care of home is most important before you start trying to change the world, take care of your house. And so homework. And all of it, you were talking about hard work and homework, but it's always sometimes hard work if you're not willing to do it. And so the more you do it, it becomes easier to have conversations like this, to be able to know that you're going to make mistakes. That's the reality of things. There's nothing in life that's perfect. We all make mistakes as it comes to this work. You don't always know the right thing to say. But the reality is if you're diving into trying to do the right thing, if you are trying to correct any error that you've made, that matters. And so my thing is, what's your heart work going to be? Are you really going to do some homework? And when it becomes hard, are you going to figure out ways to come back to the table and have more discussions like this? And so to answer you, yeah, I'm always going to promote the library. I believe in public libraries. That's just me. Uh, but uh, um, what I would say is doing some of your own individual work leads into how you're a better leader, leads into how your team sees people, leads down to the case study of how it affects the bottom line and the financial growth of your organization and how it will benefit the state of West Virginia. You know, Misha, I did not, you're right. Uh, I wouldn't say it was weird, but it was unexpected. I didn't know you were going to point to the public library system, but thank you for doing that. Uh, I'll quickly say we're honored within the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce to have several of the public library systems within our membership, including the Kanawha Charleston and the Cabell Huntington Library Systems. So uh, we, uh, we're, we're, we're honored to have them in our membership, and you took me by surprise with that answer, and uh, I love the answer. As one who was taken to the library from the time I can really barely remember uh, but going to the library obviously made an impression on me because I was taken there at a very young age and I remember it and I remember even some of the librarians who showed me around the children's section and helped me find um, interesting books. My first, the first book I owned was called Danny and the Dinosaur by Sid Hoff and um, my uncle took me to buy it when I was uh, I think I had to learn a couple of words, and once I learned a couple of words, uh, my mother's brother took me to get the first book that I wanted, which was Danny and the Dinosaur. So uh, those are nice. Good memories, right? Yeah, yeah. Good those memories. things, that, that, have, that, that wasn't recent, as you might uh, notice. <laughs> so um, those things make an impression. Well, let's talk a little about how you see us doing in West Virginia. You hold a very respected position as a vice president at our state's largest university system. Uh, you have served in the West Virginia legislature. Uh, you have an impressive academic background. So let's talk uh, candidly for a little bit. How are we doing and what could we do better? You know, I always celebrate the accomplishments that we continue to make in the state of West Virginia, but I also desperately hold on to the hope of who we could be. And, and I say that because I really, I, I've never understood um, at times, we don't have the luxury of exclusion here in the state of West Virginia. You know, when I think about things, we have business to get to. And, 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 and you know, when, I, when we talked about this, uh, I'd given kind of a thought of where I wanted this to go. And, and the, 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 the title I gave it was In This Together. And we really should be in this together. And we should be holding individuals accountable meaning that we should be calling them out in conversations. If we're in a boardroom and we're having a discussion that actually is exclusive of individuals in this state, if our whole mission is to grow the state of West Virginia and to give our children and our elderly a safe space and a place to be, then we should not be doing anything or allowing anyone to interrupt that. 
And if their business practice mindsets and our perspective does that or creates some negative light to us, we should have the courage to be able to speak up and say to them, you know, that doesn't go along with our motto, motto as a state. Mountaineers are always free is what we say. And if that's what it is, then we need to give people opportunity to, to have those opportunities, to give them access to information, to give them access to opportunity, to give them opportunities such as industries that will come here. When you think about some of these Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 100 companies, they're not having the, they're not proving the case uh, for diversity anymore. They're far since learned. <laughs> far since learned the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion. They understand the impact of what belonging means to a culture that they want to be successful. Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble has a beautiful campaign as it relates to diversity, equity, inclusion. And it's not something they do just during diversity, I mean, during uh, February. They do this throughout the whole entire year. They're committed to it. McDonald's also is an organization that does not look at one month over another. Now, they highlight it, they give awareness to, but they also have invested in community outreach. You can go through a litany of, group, uh, of, of organizations and companies. And so when I know about you all and the work that the chamber does, we're always trying to attract businesses to the state. And what they do is they look at the tone of the state. They look at the things that we say and the things that we do, and they determine, can we bring a workforce and make them understand the importance of how they can add to the culture of West Virginia? And can West Virginia add to the culture of our company? And if they feel that that's not the case, they're not going to say yes to the, to, the, to, the, to the effort that we're providing. Now, that doesn't mean we can't attract business. Let me make sure I'm very clear about it. But it does mean that we cannot grow in the way in which we have committed to our children that we want to. That's what it means. When we talk about brain drain and those conversations, what are people leaving the state for? What are they leaving? Are we asking those questions? Do people feel like they're being seen here? Do they feel as though they can be their full self authentically? Do they feel like they have opportunity and access to things across the state, not just in the capital city, not just in Huntington, not where they're just big campuses, but can they find themselves throughout? Do rural West Virginians feel as though they're being seen and heard? I can go through the different groups that we have here in the state of West Virginia, but the reality is, are we ourselves, when we're talking about economic development, being diverse in how we are approaching this? And do we really have an intent? Are we just doing business as we always have done it? And I say to you before, I said, I desperately hold on to the hope of who we can be because I always get excited about that. I have this bubble of optimism that I live in and I stay away from soft objects occasionally where it doesn't get bust, my little, <laughs> my little hope doesn't get burst, but uh, I push up against the edge of that, that regardless because I, I never lose hope in who we can be. And that's why I do the work I do. That's why I've done the things I've done in the past because I always see the better of who we are versus sometimes how we present ourselves. And I'd also say that we have to define who we're gonna be. I've said that earlier when I talked about it because all of us, no matter where you've come from, if you're here in the state of West Virginia, you're home. Doesn't matter how long you've been here. I hope you're feeling that you're home. It's our responsibility to make you feel like you're home. Um, and so if, if that's the case, then we have to make sure that we're keeping those individuals that we're saying we want to call home here and hearing from them and their perspectives and things that they need, you know, things that they need, the grocery stores. It's not always just about how do you have the conversation, but what are some of the things, the grocery stores in certain communities? You know, we can go through a litany of those discussions, but, and again, we have a short time. I don't want to go too deep, but, but, but there's ways in which we can really um, find each other in the work of diversity if we allow ourselves that opportunity. Diversity, equity, inclusion is crucial for the growth of West Virginia, is crucial for our children, and it is crucial for how we as a, as a state will actually make a global impact. And so I think that um, I, I, I continue to hold hope for where we can go. You're going to be fantastic as a speaker <laughs> at the upcoming Women's Leadership Summit on March 29th and 30th of this year. You are going to be fantastic. Thank so <clears throat> thank you for agreeing to do that. And we really look forward to seeing you again. I'm going to ask Kaylin George if um, she has any questions in the chat or anything that she wants to use in wrapping up. We have promised the people who participate um, that we will hold this to 
30 minutes or so. We're kind of at the or so period. So let me jump over to Kaylin for a minute. Thanks, Steve. And thank you so much, Misha, for your time today. Um, and listeners, the audience members, if you do have any questions, please just leave them in the Q&A. We might have time for one or two. I know I myself have a couple of questions, um, as others might be thinking of some. Um, the first one is just, I know that you have spoken about, you know, carrying this these messages throughout the year. Can you give us some examples? How can people listening today carry these messages and what you've said throughout the rest of the year? So I had the pleasure of actually speaking to a law school class yesterday. And one of the books that we were reading from was Lawyers as Leaders. And um, in, in that discussion, we, we, we talked about the impact on the legal profession. And even though they're second and third years, my charge to them is how will you begin to have this discussion about diversity right now when you're taking interviews, as you're going into this space, you know, we, we forget sometimes that we're not just giving an opportunity for employment, but people are actually getting a gift and talent from the individual that's coming in. But how will you ask them the efforts of what they're doing toward diversity, equity, inclusion, just in your interviewing process? What's your courage look like to ask that? How they will contribute to your growth, professional development. And so to answer you, I mean, I would say to you, what will you be doing throughout the year? to make sure you are not only one doing your homework and, and making sure you're paying attention to how you can grow, but how will you in the, the space that you're given advance the conversation of diversity, equity, and inclusion, but not just have a conversation because I told you before, we have things to do. We have business to get to. And so what's the action steps that you'll make? If you're planning a program and you know that's set out, what are, what's it look like as it relates to diversity in that conversation? Is that something you can bring to the forefront? is is you know if you are having a, a, a you know you, you're part of and I use this as you know people are part of book clubs you learn a lot I mean I don't short change what a book is I got a great library my thing is what's your what's your look what's your I call Rolodex but what is your your catalog look like what's your what's the diversity of your book club you know what are you talking about um, what's some of your movie selections? These are easy things. I'm being very honest about it. it's easy things but sometimes may be very hard because people have never thought of it before and so uh, what are some webinars you can actually attend? You know, all of our schools, West Virginia State University, West Virginia University, Marshall, Glenville State, Wesleyan, all of these schools have programming. All of them have some level of engagement. So no matter what county you live in, you can actually make yourself available to go to some of those programs and expand yourself to see exactly how you might be able to, to, to grow from there too. So how are, you, how are you using the space that you're given, the authority that you're given, and, and, and moving in those ways to, 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 to move forward with the diversity, equity, and inclusion that will benefit the state of West Virginia? It's more than just us. And I think that's the thing when I say we're in this together. We're in this together. When you grow, Kaylin, I grow. When Steve grows and Kathy grows, I grow. And when I grow, you grow. And when we start seeing it separately, that's when we, are, we have the problems. But when we start seeing, it gives us an opportunity to really grow as a community, to grow as a state, because we're one West Virginia. And we need to be really focused on how we, we add to that conversation. Thank you so much. And I, I really love your message of in this together. It really um, puts everything into perspective and with that, um, do you have any closing thoughts for us or food for thought um, as we wrap up? I mean, I think I've shared some, some, hopefully some good gems with you today, but what I would say to you is, you know, like I've talked to you before and, and, and uh, Kaylin has said in this together, I want you to really understand that when I do well, you do well, when I'm suffering, you're suffering, or you should be because no West Virginian should ever be feeling as though they're not safe. No West Virginian should ever feel like they can't be authentic. When we talk about diversity and inclusion, it's very fluid. And I oftentimes, when people forget that, you know, I take on every perspective and celebrate that, even if it's something I don't agree with, I have to give space to it because those voices matter. But because I've given people an opportunity to be heard, they'll hear me as well. And then that's the dialogue that's there. That's the conversation that begins. And so that's what we need if we can have that conversation, if we can give people a space to be heard. Some of the things that we're feeling, some of the things that people get afraid of when we're talking about diversity, we can remove that. There should be no fear when we're talking about diversity and inclusion. There should be no fear. There should be a celebration of growth. There should be the added effort of how we can grow our state. It should see me and you in this work. 
and we should be able to truly be in this together. And so for me, I, I continue and I would love to continue to have the conversation. If you're able to come to the event uh, at the Greenbrier, I'm happy to have that, you know, tune into some of the activities we have here. If you want to contribute to anything that our, our program is doing, look at our website. We're happy to, to engage that discussion. And so what I can say to you is we might have just had 30 some odd minutes today, but we do this every single day. And I do it with as much love and passion as I possibly can, because it does matter to me how I leave the state of West Virginia. Well, thank you so much uh, for your, inspi your insight and your inspirational words. Uh, we do have not a question from the audience, um, but a comment that we also agree with um, from our case. It's not a question, but Misha is a rock star and we're lucky she's in our state. And we, of course, feel the same way too. Thank you so much for your time today. We're very much looking forward to your discussion at the Women's Leadership Summit later this month. Um, and we we appreciate you. Thank you. But thank you. And thank you, Mark, for that comment. I really do appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank Vice you. This... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You have a beautiful day. You too. Thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you.